If you've watched my YouTube channel before, you've probably heard me mention that I have rosacea and this is what my rosacea looked like at the height of my flares. So today I'm going to be sharing what I did to get my rosacea under control and what I continue to do to keep it that way. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm Dr. Sam Ellis. I'm a board certified medical and cosmetic dermatologist in Northern California, and I'm here to help you understand your skin and find products that work for you. So if that sounds good, give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Before I get into my personal rosacea story, let's do a quick overview of rosacea. So rosacea is a chronic but treatable condition that primarily affects the face. And I say treatable rather than curable because there is no known cure for rosacea. Once you're diagnosed with rosacea, it's something that you carry with you typically for the rest of your life to some degree. That doesn't mean there aren't good interventions to make it better, to reduce the flares, to make you more comfortable. But if you go into your rosacea treatment expecting a cure and to never have to deal with rosacea again, that's not the right expectation to have. When you think of any chronic medical condition, whether or not it affects the skin, high blood pressure, for example, hypothyroidism, the thought is that as you continue your medication or the lifestyle interventions that you've pursued to keep your medical condition under control, your disease will be well managed. However, if you come off of your medication or you stop participating in those meaningful lifestyle interventions, your disease comes back or it reveals itself again. And the same goes for rosacea. So many times my patients are on therapy for a few months, their rosacea is a lot better, and then they want to come off of therapy. And that's when we have to have this conversation of, We've made you better, but in order to maintain the control of rosacea that you're looking for, we need to keep you on some type of treatment intervention. I think people traditionally think of rosacea as manifesting on the skin as redness, easy flushing, dilated invisible blood vessels, but rosacea can encompass so much more than that. It can show up as pimples or little red bumps on the skin, so it's often mistaken or misdiagnosed as acne. It also includes things like skin sensitivity, burning sensation, stinging sensation, inability to tolerate a wide variety of topical products. And so rosacea is so much more than just redness. I also wanted to put this video out there because rosacea affects so many people. It's estimated that about 16 million Americans have rosacea and that about 5.5% of the global population is affected. The other thing that's worth noting is that rosacea is typically misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed in skin of color. So rosacea is not just a disease of Caucasian skin or of fair skin. People with deeper skin tones or more melanated skin can also have rosacea. And with that, I think we're ready to delve into my personal rosacea journey. The last thing I'll mention is that what has worked for me and my rosacea may not work for you and your rosacea. I think it's nice to see what someone has gone through and all the things I've tried and what has worked and what has not worked so that you understand that it's a process and it's not always like the first thing you try is going to be your hit it out of the park home run type of treatment. But I also think it's really important to recognize that you need to team up with your own personal dermatologist to make sure that the treatments you're doing are right for your rosacea and that you have someone who is a professional who knows your medical history to guide you through your rosacea journey as well. So I was formally diagnosed with rosacea in 2015 and something very pivotal happened in that year. I moved from Michigan where I had completed my medical school training at the University of Michigan to Denver, Colorado, where I was starting my intern year. And Denver has a pretty particular climate. It has super dry air. There is no moisture when you're walking around. Two, it's at elevation. So Denver is known as the Mile High City. It sits at about 5,300 feet. So you're up closer to the sun. And we know that UV protection goes down the higher up in elevation that you go. And also Denver gets these like wild temperature swings where it's like 80 degrees and sunny one day. And then the next day it's 32 degrees and snowing. And I really think that that climate took a toll on my skin over time. Also, while I was there, I was spending a lot more time outside. I was only in Denver for my intern year and I knew that going in and I wanted to take full advantage of being in an incredibly beautiful nature filled state. And so I was hiking all the time. I was going skiing. I was spending tons and tons of time outdoors, much more time outdoors than I did when I was crammed away studying all throughout medical school for the prior four years. And so I feel like that combination of the climate plus all of that excess outdoor time kind of did me in. Now I'm not blaming my rosacea on moving to Denver. I absolutely loved living there. I have a genetic predisposition to rosacea. 
my father has rosacea. I've seen it in some of my aunts and uncles. And I had spent a lot of time outdoors growing up as well, getting that excess UV exposure, which can predispose you to having manifestations of rosacea later in life. I just think at that point in my life, I sort of hit an inflection point where all of a sudden my skin was like, mm -mm -mm. so I started noticing that I was getting a lot more red. So I was easily flushing. And then the biggest thing was that my skin felt uncomfortable. Like I would get these waves of heat and burning in my cheeks. And then when I would look in the mirror, my skin would be bright red. And that had really never happened to me before. Yes, growing up, I would flush kind of easily if I got embarrassed or if I exercised really hard. That's just normal flushing, physiologic flushing. But it's that symptom of burning heat, that rising discomfort in your face that really started at that point in time. I also began to notice my pores. For my whole life, I had never really noticed my pores. And it was really in that year that when I would look in the mirror, I'd be like, oh, what's going on on my face? And it would be almost this subtle swelling and increased pore prominence on my nose, on my cheeks, on my chin. And I'll be the first one to tell you as a dermatologist, everyone has pores, but it was a very abrupt change where I never noticed my pores before to all of a sudden it, they almost looked more pronounced and my face had like very mild, subtle swelling. But really the thing that bothered me the most were sort of these blooms of heat where seemingly out of nowhere, my skin would just become really red and hot and uncomfortable. It really wasn't until I saw my dermatologist and she brought up the idea of rosacea that I even considered that I had distinct triggers. Cause she asked me, what are your triggers? And I was like, I don't have any triggers. It just happens out of nowhere. But then after that visit, I really started paying attention and realizing, oh, every time I go on a long hike or spend a lot of time outdoors, and if I haven't been really properly sun protected, my skin feels really hot later in the day. Or every time I drink alcohol, especially wine, my skin turns super, super red. Or anytime I sit next to a fireplace or the indoor heating is on too high, my skin is on fire. And that's when I realized I do have distinct triggers, but because these things had also been part of my life for so long, I just, didn't really pay attention to the fact that they were happening at such specific moments. So step one in this journey was getting my rosacea diagnosis. And that's a really important step because I've had so many people come into my office thinking that they have rosacea, trying to treat their skin as if they have rosacea, but they actually have something else going on. So before you really embark on your treatment interventions, start with the diagnosis because it's only going to respond and get better if you're treating the right thing. And the second part of my rosacea journey is treatment. What I actually did to get my rosacea better, that's probably why you clicked on this video to watch it in the first place. So let's talk about my rosacea treatment. The number one thing I did to improve my rosacea was limit or in some cases completely avoid my triggers. I would venture to say that for most people who have rosacea, limiting or avoiding their triggers will be the most impactful intervention that they make when addressing their rosacea. However, it can also be one of the hardest things to do because it usually involves making some significant changes to your lifestyle and breaking habits or changing your lifestyle for a skin condition is a big commitment and you really have to decide when you're going to treat your rosacea, how committed to these interventions you want to be. And you just have to understand that if you're not willing to avoid your triggers, there might be a limit to how much improvement you can get with your rosacea. So when it came to my rosacea, of course I had to spend some time identifying my triggers and then I had to really decide which triggers were worth avoiding or limiting and which ones contribute to the richness and the enjoyment of my life and that I'm not willing to sacrifice. Understanding that if I don't eliminate all of my triggers, I will still have some rosacea flares to some degree, but they will certainly get better by at least limiting the triggers that I'm willing to cut out. I'll give you a couple of examples. So I knew that every time I spent time outdoors, whether it was skiing or hiking, my skin would feel like crap later in the day. It would be really red. It would feel like it was throbbing or burning. But I also recognized that when I was out doing those activities, I wasn't optimally protecting my skin from the sun or wind. I wasn't reapplying my sunscreen as frequently. I wasn't really wearing a wide brim hat. I was still in like my baseball cap era. I also wasn't wearing like a balaclava or something to protect my face from the wind when I was skiing. So there was a lot of hits my skin was taking throughout that process. So rather than say, Hey, I'm not going to hike or ski or be outside, which is a huge passion of mine. I love that. It brings so much joy to my life. I realized I could augment my behavior during those times to make that less of a trigger for me. Another very clear trigger for my rosacea was alcohol or is alcohol. And I feel like at that point in my life, I was drinking casually, but not a lot, but I felt like I could drink a lot less and still be really satisfied with my life and not miss it. So now I drink probably somewhere between five and 10 alcoholic beverages a year. It's just not my personal vice. and. 
I feel like my rosacea is so much better. I also feel better for loads of other reasons that I don't drink alcohol, but I think the effects that it's had on my skin have been tremendously positive. Now I live in Northern California and if I get invited to go wine tasting with my girlfriends, I'm not skipping it. I just have to understand that my skin is gonna feel kind of crappy for a few days after that event. And I have to weigh the pros and cons of that. And that's what I ask my patients to do too. It's just understand what your limits are, what your triggers are, what you're willing to sacrifice, what you aren't, and then adjust your life accordingly. But trigger avoidance is just one piece of my rosacea treatment puzzle. I also changed up my skincare. I started prescription treatment. I started in-office treatment. So let's talk a little bit about those. The first thing I did is I stopped overwashing my skin. I feel like my generation was taught that you're supposed to wash your face twice a day and that's a sign of both cleanliness, but that's also going to keep your skin healthy. But that can actually be quite harsh and stripping, especially for those who suffer from rosacea or other conditions of skin sensitivity like atopic dermatitis. So I reduced my face washing from twice a day, morning and night to just at night. In the morning, I just get my face wet with water. I don't use any type of cleanser or soap. And that alone has made my skin feel a lot better. Staying within the category of skin cleansing, another thing I did to really help get my rosacea under control is I stopped using makeup wipes and I started doing a different type of double cleanse in the evening to prepare my skin for the rest of my evening routine. The concept of a double cleanse is to perform a two-step cleansing routine in which you wash your face with some type of gentle cleanser, and then you wash your face again with a different type of gentle cleanser. Using a makeup wipe is kind of a double cleanse because you're washing your face with that, and then you're doing some other type of cleanser to remove anything else that's left on your face. But the makeup wipe isn't particularly gentle, especially for me. And so when I switched to an alternative double cleanse in which I was using either micellar water, a cleansing balm, a cleansing oil as my first cleansing step, and then following that with a liquid gel cleanser, my skin was so much happier. Happier. Also, let's be honest, there were plenty of nights where I would just use a makeup wipe and not pursue any further nighttime skincare routine, and that certainly wasn't going to make my rosacea better. I have tried hundreds of cleansers over the years. To this day, probably one of my most used first cleansing steps is my Bioderma Micellar Water. I sort of think of this as the gentlest makeup remover. And if you're in the habit of using makeup wipes, I feel like this is a nice transition because it doesn't feel so abrupt if you've never used a cleansing oil or cleansing balm, for example, because I like to pour my micellar water onto a little cotton round and then swipe it over my face to remove my makeup and my sunscreen at the end of the day and get me prepped for my second cleansing step. And that really makes me feel like I'm using a makeup wipe, but it's so much more gentle on my skin. And then follow this up with a gentle cleanser, CeraVe, Cetaphil, Vanna Cream, they all make really nice gentle cleansers. One thing you'll notice if you suffer with rosacea is that some cleansers will really agree with your skin and some will not, and it's not predictable. I could recommend one gentle cleanser and you could be like, oh, that didn't work for my skin at all. And another person could try the same cleanser and be like, oh, holy grail, I'm, I'm just like you, Dr. Ellis. So it's really important that when you have a rosacea that you understand that you might need a little bit of trial and error to find the products that really work well and complement your skin. That being said, if you have rosacea and you're watching this video and you found a gentle cleanser that you really love, put it in the comments below. I think people who suffer from rosacea always need more viable options, so I'd love to hear from you. Another skincare habit I changed once I was diagnosed with rosacea was I became extremely consistent about my sunscreen application. Over the last eight years, there's probably a handful of days that I haven't applied sunscreen and it has just become part of my daily habit so I don't forget it and so my skin is always protected. Of course, there are days that I put my sunscreen on and I never go outside and did I really need sunscreen on that day? No, but by having it as part of my daily routine, my skin always has that baseline level of protection. I also got a lot better about reapplying my sunscreen. So anytime I'm out hiking, skiing, by the pool, at the park with my son, I'm putting on sunscreen a minimum of every two hours. Now, if I'm inside at work all day, at my desk, in patient rooms, am I reapplying during that time? No, I kind of have that baseline protection from the morning and I'm not really getting excess UV exposure. But anytime I'm outdoors and have true UV exposure consistently, sunscreen's getting reapplied super consistently as well. If you're looking for a good sunscreen that's going to agree with your skin, I have so many videos out there talking about my favorite sunscreens. I do wanna give a special shout out though to Elta MD UV Physical SPF 41 because this was probably the first sunscreen I ever used consistently. Like I grew up swimming, I would put on my banana boat or my copper tone or whatever as needed, but 
When I was getting into a daily sunscreen habit, this was the one I was reaching for. I really liked that it had a little bit of a tint and a little bit of a blurring effect. So I feel like it makes my skin look better. And I really like that it was gentle on my skin. Even now it's one of my top recommended sunscreens for people who have rosacea or people who have sensitive skin in general. Sometimes I get asked, Hey, if you have rosacea, do you need to use mineral or physical sunscreens or are chemical sunscreens? Okay. And that really varies person to person. I, for example, have rosacea and I can use the whole spectrum, any type of UV filter, and I don't really have problems with it. Other people who have rosacea really like to stick to the mineral sunscreens. Other people with rosacea really like to stick to the chemical sunscreens. So again, it's a little bit about testing out some various sunscreens. I think it's such a good investment to try sunscreens and figure out what you like, because once you land on your Holy Grail sunscreen, you can use it for the rest of your life and be so much more protected. So I stopped washing my face twice a day. I started using a double cleanser. I started being consistent with my sunscreen application and reapplication. And then the final thing I did for skin protection was I started not just relying on my sunscreen for UV protection, but also started wearing a wide brim hat more consistently as well as sunglasses because sunscreen is not fail proof. You can still get UV damage. Even when you apply sunscreen, you're not going to apply it perfectly every time. You're not going to reapply it perfectly every time. So having other ways that you're protecting your skin from the sun is super important. And wide brim hats have been a staple for me. Also, when I hike, I will typically bring a bandana. So I have one by Cooley Bar, which is a company that makes a lot of different sun protective clothing. And I will use it up over my face if I feel like I'm walking on a really reflective surface where sun is not just hitting me from above, but it's also bouncing off of concrete and hitting me in the face. I also really like having a bandana to wear over my face if it suddenly gets really windy or it's really cold because it's another way that I'm protecting my skin from my rosacea triggers. The reason I'm placing so much emphasis on sun protection is because not only is UV radiation a rosacea trigger for me, it is the most common trigger for rosacea. So over 80% of people who suffer from rosacea will have UV exposure as one of their triggers. So I just wanna give you lots of different options of ways you can protect yourself. In addition to those skincare interventions, I also use prescription medication to treat my rosacea. So let's talk about that next. Before I talk too much about my prescription interventions, I wanna be very clear about something because it actually comes up a lot when I talk to my patients about rosacea interventions, which is the vast majority of prescription medication that we have for rosacea is good at treating the pimples and bumps that come with rosacea. If you have redness, if you have flushing, those are much harder to treat with medication. It's not to say that there aren't some interventions. There are both topical and oral medications that can help with that redness and flushing component temporarily, but they also come with potential side effects. And when I was deciding on how aggressive I wanted to be with treating my rosacea, those particular interventions, for example, topical oxymetazoline or oral clonidine to help with flushing didn't really appeal to me. My flushing wasn't so bad that I felt like I wanted to be on those particular medications. So the prescription medications that I opted to use and those that worked best for me were really to address sort of that poor prominence, that slight bit of swelling, that slight reactivity of my skin. And I used a combination of prescription azelaic acid, 15% and sodium sulfacetamide sulfur cleanser. So that is a prescription sulfur based cleanser that we can prescribe for people who have rosacea. And those were the two things I used the most when I was trying to get my rosacea under control, which was, you know, almost a decade ago now. Now, remember how I said in the beginning of the video that there's no cure for rosacea, but it can get better or worse over your lifetime based on a myriad of factors. So I don't use those prescription medications that frequently anymore because after I didn't live in Denver, after I was consistent with my trigger avoidance, after I really implemented a year or more of new skincare practices, my rosacea got so much better. So I still have a prescription for azelaic acid. I still use it intermittently, especially if I'm traveling to a lot of hot climates or I feel like I'm gonna be doing a lot of things that might trigger my rosacea, but they're not consistent parts of my routine now because I'm happy with my rosacea just with my lifestyle interventions. Okay, that's not entirely true. I'm happy with my rosacea because of my lifestyle interventions and the in-office treatments that I do. So let's talk about that final puzzle piece of getting my rosacea better, which is the treatments I do in my office 
to improve my redness. The thing that bugged me the most about my rosacea, aside from that uncomfortable feeling of my skin, which got a lot better with trigger avoidance, was the redness and the visible dilated blood vessels on my cheeks and nose and chin. And those red blood vessels are structural changes in the skin, and there is no skincare in the world that's going to make those go away. The only way you can make those go away is to actually destroy those little blood vessels, and I do that with a laser. In my practice, I have something called a V-beam laser. That is a brand name of a pulsed dye laser. So pulsed dye laser is the type of laser that it is. And it is meant to target hemoglobin in the skin. Hemoglobin is the protein that is inside your red blood cells and it's what gives your blood that red color. And so that laser is specifically designed to target that redness and eliminate it or reduce it. So I have a V-beam treatment done twice a year, maybe three times a year. When I was initially getting my redness under control, I had a lot more blood vessels on my face because I hadn't treated my rosacea pretty much ever and I'd been accumulating them over a lifetime. So when I initially started treating myself with the V-beam, I did three back-to-back -back treatments, like once a month, for three months and then I went into maintenance mode, which is a couple of treatments a year. Now there are other lasers or devices out there that can target redness in the skin. For example, IPL, BBL, uh, XLV laser. We just happen to use a V-beam laser in our practice. I think it's the gold standard. I feel very comfortable using it. So a lot of times people ask me, well, what's the best device for treating rosacea or treating red blood vessels or addressing redness in the skin? And it's not so much about the device, it's about the person operating the device. What are they comfortable using? What kind of results do they get with that technology? Even though I have maintenance sessions a couple times a year, that's probably because I'm a little more nitpicky than the average patient. A lot of my patients will do sort of their initial rosacea blood vessel treatments, three or four treatments back to back, and then maybe once a year or every couple of years, they'll have a single treatment to help them maintain their results. The thing about rosacea is that if you treat it with a laser, it doesn't reduce your tendency to make blood vessels. So it's not that your blood vessels that you treated are coming back, but you're going to continue to make new blood vessels over a lifetime. And if you have rosacea, those blood vessels might be more prominent or more reactive and more bothersome. And you may want to continue maintenance treatments so that you can continue to address them. Unfortunately, this is not something that's covered by insurance. This is considered an aesthetic or a cosmetic treatment. And so unfortunately, that means that it's not going to be financially available to everyone, but I wanted to be really honest about what I do and not pretend that it's all skincare and trigger avoidance and prescription medication. I need a machine to make me the most satisfied with my rosacea, and I think it's important to be forthcoming about that. So that is how I got my rosacea under control and how I keep it under control. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't get flares from time to time, I certainly do, and I still hate them and I still think they're super annoying, but they are less intense and less frequent than they used to be, and that's the reality of living with a chronic health condition, a chronic skin condition, is that you might have really good control, but there still might be triggers or flares that come up from time to time. And it's all about lessening the intensity of those, lessening the frequency of those, and having them be part of your life, but not take over your life. Do you deal with rosacea? Share any tips or products that have helped you in the comments. I'm sure it will help other people as well. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time.